if you're a social change theater, it's like you got to go out in the street with a cup. And um, we do that. And we once even had a Turkish rug sale uh, because we had gone to Istanbul and we and met a, a guy who, who invited us for dinner and they said, how'd you like to have a rug sale in your house? And we said, hey, uh, gee, uh, can we get 10%? Uh, and he said, we looked at each other, uh, uh, and, I, and our, our eyes lit up. We thought, well, that's one way of raising money, and we made 4000 uh, from that rug sale. So uh, I, I don't put anything off the table. I think anything is on the table uh, if you're raising money for uh, varying issues. And, and uh, I think you have to be very inventive and creative uh, as to how you do that. Um, and you, know, you never know what can uh, fall in your path uh, that is an opportunity uh, in, that, in that way. So, uh, but, but right now, my, my question is what uh, I need to find other theaters. Besides funding, uh, we want to do it again uh, in New York so that we get more exposure um, and, have, uh, and can have the, the opportunity to have other theaters see uh, the, the play. And, and uh, I just recently connected with a director who I hadn't seen in many, many years. And uh, I got him to read the play, which is not easy. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so he, he, li he really liked it. And so he's pitching the play. But, but uh, you know, he's not pitching it. He's not employed by any theater uh, uh, anymore. He used to uh, have his own theater. Um, so, uh, and he's very discouraged about uh, what people are doing in the theater period because they're not, uh, as we uh, know, uh, they're not um, picking the burning issues of the day to, to present to their audiences simply because they're afraid or they're self-censoring themselves or, or they have board members who are invested in the fossil fuel industry and uh, they're not going to do a play that's against the fossil fuel industry. Um, so these issues make it really, really important to connect with theaters that uh, like to, that are adventurous, uh, want to take risks, want to wake their audiences up. Uh, um, and uh, so, you know, that's uh, my, my main issue. I get a couple of pieces of paper because I'm going to run out. Yes. <coughs> okay. All right, so let me read back your questions. How do we connect with other theaters who might be interested in this or risk taking adventurous mm -hmm. entrepreneurial, yes. given the current funding situation? Okay. So um, <coughs> I'm. Uh, work with a group called Musicians United to Protect Crystal Bay, which is fighting the pebble mine up in Alaska, which is a huge issue, but it's not climate change. So my concern is in the sort of siloing that's happening in climate change funding. Um, and like I've been talking to, excuse me, Josh Fox about how we link fracking to the mining. I really feel like we need to broaden the question to me as far as we can to out to social justice. Um, and allow for all the activities that people are doing within that so that we don't get into this, I think, funder sort of initiated denial of what's important and, and, and what's worth funding. So that's my question is how do we have that conversation broaden the definition? <clears throat> okay, I'm Judith Knight. I'm from London. Um, I arrived one o'clock this morning, so I'm a bit weary. Uh, we're producers. My organization's called Arts Admin. It's, it's a very boring name, but we do a lot of really interesting projects. <laughs> I'm the one to take blame for the, the name. It's, very, it was, it, it's 35 years old, Arts Admin now. Uh, and we, do, we, we produce a lot of site-specific or engaged projects or all sorts of things. In the last 10, or and Marta knows all this, but in the last 10 or 12 years, we've got more and more in, involved in the issue of climate change and have commissioned and 
and produced projects about the issue uh, and we've also got involved in how to tour better, how to work better, how to tour internationally with an organisation called Julie's Bicycle which many of you might know about. But for me, one of the, and, and we've done some fantastic projects and I'm terribly proud of them and we're part of a European network called Imagine 2020 which is looking ahead and ra we raise money from the European um, funding for a five-year programme and there's 11 European partners and we all, it sounds like we've got a fortune, it's one point something million euros but there's 11 of us and it's five years so it's really not a huge amount of money but we do a festival every two years called Two Degrees Festival which is looking at that issue and some of them are very small engaged projects, one-to-ones and things like that, some of them are big outdoor projects. My question always is, though, um, how, uh, how do we get an audience that's bigger than the usual suspects? How do we get an audience that isn't the audience you know or come anyway because they're totally focused on this issue? How do you actually reach people who don't think it's an issue? How do we actually widen it? Because that's something that always frustrates me, and I think we, we do a little bit of it, and then you suddenly hit, you, know, you know everybody in the audience is already... And whether you do funny work or serious work or really beautiful work or something engaging, you still think you're, you're preaching to the converted, as it were, and that's something I, I'm really keen that we try not to, not to do, try and provide it anymore. Everybody, um, thanks for having me. My name is Jamelyn Ebelacker. Um, I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm also the performing arts program assistant at the Institute of American Indian Arts uh, at Santa Fe as well. Um, I, I don't think I have too many burning questions at the moment, um, but we have a lot of uh, students and faculty, um, community activists as well, who are uh, fiercely protective of our environment and are um, definitely uh, against the pebble mines and the Keystone XLs of the world. and. Um, a lot of us are, are personally affected. I, my Pueblo is, is downwind from the Los Alamos National Laboratories um, and our water is heavily polluted. And so these are, these are things that, that affect our, our everyday lives and, and we strive as uh, students and future um, Native American leaders to um, bring about that, that conversation and to hopefully bring about change as well. So that is me. Thank you. I'm Marta Kern, and I direct Eco Arts Connections, which is based in Boulder, Colorado, and we bring together science, arts, urban planning, all kinds of different disciplines um, in projects to uh, inspire more sustainable living. A lot of it has to do with climate change and global change, and I was just in Washington, and now the language has shifted even from global change to and sustainability to resilience is the latest hottest word now that doesn't inflame the Republican right, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and we do a lot where we um, we produce and we present and we initiate and we convene and we do all kinds of things for, uh, with artists, um, performing visual artists. And um, most recently we've been bringing artists especially into non-arts um, conferences to help people understand how the arts can be an ally um, and, um, in drawing new attention and um, solutions to particular issues. So for example, um, the Beck Conference, which is Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change a Conference, which if you're in the United States is one of the best ones that there is, I think, in the US in terms of what learning about what works and what doesn't in terms of shifting beliefs and behaviors. Um, there are engineers and social scientists and kinds of folks, and we did a panel there with three artists, and it was, I'm so happy because we were so nervous. <laughs> um, to, uh, it was kind of a hit of the conference, and people were buzzing about it the whole time because they didn't have an understanding of what the arts really can do in terms of um, igniting people's awareness and, and, and really providing solutions as well. So I'm really thrilled to be here, and I would like to ask, if we could, to circulate a piece of paper so that everybody could write down their print, their names, and emails, please, and then we'll just Xerox it and then in the old fashioned way and, and circulate. Do Is that already have, happening? I'm sorry. I'm like, no, do you not have a burning question? Oh, my burning question. This? Um, I, I think suggestion. everybody's all these, these great burning questions that I'm really involved with Judith's question too a lot about how to reach a, a broader audience and how to reframe and I get very emotional about this, the role of the arts in this time 
Um, and I sometimes think about um, uh, Nero fiddling as Rome is burning, and I think, well, maybe he was a really great musician, and maybe he was just into his riff, and he just didn't notice. And I'm reading a book now that is um, that Rome is burning, and I didn't, and I'm just reading a book now that's about um, the turn of turn of the um, two centuries ago in Vienna of um, sort of the art scene there, and about how artists were so deeply involved in their own work that they didn't notice Hitler coming into Europe. And, um, and I'll stop in just one second. There's a thing called the normalcy bias, which is a term that's used by um, people in the disaster management fields. Did you ever know that there was a thing like that? Um, it's for people who are getting people out of the way of hurricanes and you know floods and all kinds of stuff like that. The normalcy bias in layperson's language is um, that human beings cannot or have a difficult time getting their brains wrapped around um, so anything that's far from what they consider to be normal. And an example, of course, in this country is Hurricane Katrina, but another one is the Holocaust, when, I think these statistics are right, 40% of the Jews left Germany when it was starting to get really bad, and 60% stayed. And they were the most well-educated and the most well-off, because they couldn't believe that something could happen to them. So that's one of the burning questions, is how do we get people to understand that you know, it, it, it's here, it's here now, and as we have more and more frequent and intense storms um, happening, um, more and more money is gonna get siphoned into helping those victims of those natural disasters, as it should. Less and less money will be available for the arts, and if the arts is still in its art for art's sake paradigm, as it has been since the 1860s at the start of the Industrial Revolution, when it really hit, um, that we are not gonna, we're not gonna have the arts anymore, you know, in the middle of it, so. Can I just, uh, that resiliency question is huge, and it's being used as a red herring. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can include that in the discussion, mm -hmm. it's really big, yeah. and it's stopping progress. It's that. also a term that's being used by the National Endowment for the Arts when they're talking about the strength of arts and communities, is resiliency. So yeah. I think that resiliency seems to be a, a buzzword with many different connotations. But resiliency purposes. does not include renewables. Well, that's what I'm saying. This word, though, is it being used word in is different words. Right. It really depends on what we write it. Yeah, it, but it is a, a term. And it's also being used as a, as kind of a, um, um, in the social sciences sector yes. to to define communities that are um, surviving in spite of marginalization, which is in a way of justifying. Um, you know, reduction of resources right. because look, right. they're still alive. It's and adaptation it's rather than mitigation. Is yeah. 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 It's, it's exactly. a tricky one. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm sorry, and, and just one, one last little burning thing um, is uh, to how to best help people understand sustainability or resiliency or whatever the terms are in terms of not just environmental but also economic and social, cultural, and personal. So that immigration, for example, is it's a sustainability story moving from one place, you know, to another to have a better life. Sleep is a renewable energy, which I think some of us forget. <laughs> and, um, but but really seriously, you know, how do we help people to understand, um, to think more uh, systemically, ecosystemically, and um, to think about Native Americans and the indigenous perspective and. You know, I don't want to say the original systemic thinkers, but man, we got a lot to learn. I'll take it. I'll yeah, take really. It. So, that's all. Um, well, hello. Um, I'm Jocelyn Perez. I'm the administrator for theater for the New City here in New York. Um, we, well, I'm basically new there. I've been there for a couple months now, so I'm new to the whole theater and the arts administration um, aspect. But um, I am a <coughs> bio major at Hofstra University, and I'm specializing in ecology. So this really caught my attention. Um, but basically, at, uh, at our theater, we have a gallery, and we showcase a lot of protest art, uh, social reform art, uh, people coming in um, doing like uh, comics even about social reform. And we actually did Extreme Weather, uh, George Bartini's uh, Extreme mm -hmm. Weather over there, too. Uh, that's when I just started, actually, when, when we started that. Um, so basically, my, my question would be, we, we came for, to find out uh, more about funding to bring artists here, especially ones who would be showcasing that type, things that would highlight those, you know, climate change and like what could we do <laughs> to be able to fund them because we like don't have the, we get um, letters 
correspondents all the time and they're begging, can you bring us, can you help sign for, you know, co-sign for a visa, things like that, so that we, we can't afford to bring them. So I, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Freeland. I'm a, the artistic director for a company called The Lita Project. We're based duly in Denver, Colorado, and here in New York. Um, uh, we primarily work in devised work um, around social justice issues and um, and issues of equality as well. And um, we've most recently been building uh, several pieces on the environment. Uh, we premiered a, a two-part work called Watershed last year, and we're now um, building a new work on wildfires. Um, my, I, I think my burning question from our experience in the West in building these pieces in relation to our audience and then beginning to think about um, touring it and bringing it out um, is that we we come into a place where the framing of our work is so politicized that um, that it's hard to have a dialogue with presenters or with funders without it feeling like a political issue rather than an environmental or a social issue. So my question is how to how do we reframe, again, and we're seeing it happen anyways, how are we reframing the debate with <clears throat> climate change in general? How do we reframe it as it trickles down to our work um, and those who are making work about, um, about the subject? Thank you. I'm Amy Cullen, and uh, I'm the program director for Project program launching at the University of Westminster in London this year. I'm sorry, can you speak a little loud? Uh, so. relations. Sorry, I never talk very loud, so <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll try harder. Um, <laughs> my name is Amy Fullman, and uh, I work for the University of Westminster in London, and I also have worked as an arts administrator and a cultural policy researcher and practitioner. Um, and so, my maybe not burning question, but a simmering question. Um, I'm always very interested in the relationship between artists and change. And so along the lines of what we talked about so far, I think I'm also interested in talking about how to support artists who want to be part of social change in, in many different roles. Because there are some people who want to create work based on something that moves them, but don't want to be an advocate and don't want to be on the front lines of social change. And there are other people that maybe are more activist involved just by nature and I think we need to recognize that and I'm just really interested in the relationship mm. between us. Cool. Um, hi everyone, I'm Lanny Fu. I am the um, associate director of a theater company called, <coughs> oh god, excuse me, of a theater company called Critical Point Theater. Um, we are duly based in Virginia, New York and dedicated to creating new original work around social issues. And um, actually, the main reason that I'm here today is because I recently started working um, kind of on the administrative side with a group called Superhero Clubhouse. Oh, yeah. um, I think you know yeah, Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. Um, he recommended that I come here. Um, it's an eco-theater collective based in New York. Um, we do everything ranging from original devised work. We've recently been working on a series of planet plays. Um, each play is named of her planet, and each one is about a certain issue. Earth, a play about people, Mars, a play about mining, you get the idea. And um, also, uh, the clubhouse has created an environmental program or an educational program for um, elementary school kids where they uh, get a chance to write a play around certain environmental issues and then it's produced professionally and they get to see their work and it's, it's a really neat thing and um, so I'm kind of new to the whole um, I guess 
making art about climate change. And I'm, I'm here to kind of, I'm curious to learn, from, my question really is, I'm curious what, from everyone's experiences, what has been um, most palatable to audiences, or maybe that's not the right word, most, most engaging. I just want to know about those experiences when you feel like you really have made someone think about a question in a new way or reached an audience member that wouldn't have been in the room. You know, I'm curious what those little moments are and how they're achieved, I guess, really. I'm Lisa Phillips. Um, I'm with Positive Feedback. We're an initiative out of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. And um, very much like EcoArts, we uh, bring artists and scientists together for research collaborations around um, uh, for projects that, that uh, have to do with climate change or environmental sustainability. And uh, we're looking right now, one of our um, burning questions is what role the universities can play in fostering and sustaining those relationships um, so that they're mutually beneficial between the artists and the scientists and how we can, um, you know, especially at Columbia, which is a very decentralized organization, we're sort of house rich and cash poor, so there's a lot of resources that universities can, uh, can bring to the table and offer in terms of expertise and um, uh, government and community uh, engagement and uh, working with um, smaller nonprofit and activist organizations and how we can be a convener, how we can be, um, how we can, how we can really um, sort of in, infuse our curriculum with these projects and with artists and residents um, at universities and uh, or scientists and residents with artists um, and just what role we, we can continue to play in that collaborative aspect. Would you like to oh, introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I skipped over you. Yeah, well, because I think like, sorry. Uh, my name is Mara Isaacs. I'm a creative producer. I have a small company called Octopus Theatrical. Um, I'm formerly uh, the producing director at McCarter Theatre Center in Princeton, and before that I worked at Center Theatre Group in LA, but for the last 18 months I've been working as an independent uh, creative producer. And one of the, and, and, and part of that was because I found that Within institutions, there were just too many constraints in both aesthetically, the kind of work you could do, topically, and I wanted to, to kind of break down the rules of who can create what, when, where, and how. And so I'm finding independently I have a lot more freedom to follow my nose and support the work that I'm passionate about. One of the projects that I'm currently working on is a collaboration with a company called Phantom Limb, which is based here in New York, um, which is a company that harnesses choreography, visual design, video, puppetry, um, and music into their storytelling and, and have a <coughs> um, focus on ecology in their work. Uh, and particularly, we're developing a piece right now called Memory Rings, which really um, is about climate change, although maybe not quite so directly. And they have also, in their kind of research phase of the project, have been collaborating with uh, university-based scientists. Mm -hmm. They're working with Dan Schrag up at Harvard. <coughs> and and one of the conversations that comes up repeatedly is, very, you know, uh, many of the things that you were talking about as well, and probably others I just came late, is that there's so much work out there that is, you know, didactic and, you know, whether it's th through artistic projects or through a lot of the information that <coughs> scientists are disseminating, that this clearly the statistics and the information and the facts are not actually having an impact. So rather than try to recreate those things in a theatrical form, the question is, can theatrical form open up space in the viewer to make room for those facts then to penetrate? So in our work, we're really looking at um, a much more imagistic approach um, and a much more emotional approach. There's actually very little text in this piece at all. And 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 this, you know, I won't go into all the details. Of this what not this conversation is about. But but I think we are really trying to struggle with how do you move people's consciousness to a place to understand that we are here. It is happening now. This is and 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 one of the other themes that has come up in a lot of these conversations um, that the science says to talk about is time scale mm -hmm. and people's inability to understand where we are in the time scale of climate change. 
Um, and, and that's actually one of the things we're trying to take on in a theatrical manner to try. So this piece actually covers 5,000 years of human evolution from the perspective of the world's oldest living tree. Mm. Um, and really understanding one of the reasons people aren't act active in the climate change conversation is because they can't, they don't see it happening. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it must not be happening because mm -hmm. it's not in the mm -hmm. time scale of their own life cycle. Cool. So. Got a dendrochronologist for you. Yes, <laughs> he's a, he, that's what Dan Trang yeah. is a dendrochronologist. <laughs> Hi, um, Marianne Mori, I'm chairman of the board for Strike Anywhere Performance Ensemble. I uh, spent the last four years uh, developing and half improv, improv and half scripted uh, play called Same River, having to do with fracking. Mm -hmm. uh, started in upstate New York, uh, where they went up for a retreat and started talking with all of the residents about how it was impacting them, and created a play based on those interviews mm -hmm. uh, on both sides. The people who signed leases and made the money and were having the people who were terribly unhappy with the whole thing. The play has since then morphed into a performance in residence at JKO Theater here, high school here in the city. The students doing all of the research and reaching out to the companies and writing it and doing it and working out their own choreography. Doing the same thing in Brooklyn, had a performance at Irondale and had a performance at Bucknell. So the whole, pro the whole premise of it is we're all downriver. We're all from, from the same river, so we need to figure out what it is that's happening. And we need to look at both sides of the question, because mm -hmm. there's, there, there are needs that need to be met for us to continue living, and there are needs, other needs on the other side of the coin that we have to address to keep on living. So uh, that's its process. So would your burning question be, how do we look at both sides? Uh, it is, and it, it's how do we stop yelling long mm -hmm. enough to uh, talk? and come together. <coughs> and yes, we work with a lot of scientists. We, the performance at Bucknell was really amazing. <coughs> it, was all, it was actually, they were drafted to come to Bucknell and work with the, uh, the ecology and all the, the, the scientists there. And they, it's great because they pull together marketing, performance, and science departments to work together to do the performances. And that's at the high school as well as the Bucknell College level. Um. I'm Elizabeth Dowd, and I am usually based in Miami, <coughs> Florida, and I've been living for the last uh, 10 months in Brazil, doing um, so a postgraduate program around, um, I don't know, environmental performance, uh, climate crisis, and theater arts, uh, and I've, all, I've been feeling the, the great need to be with more people that are thinking about what I'm thinking about and doing what I'm doing. Um, and what I've realized is that any time that you do, any any time an artist wants to talk about the environmental collapse or the climate crisis in their work, it is immediately an, an, an inter multi transdisciplinary activity. You are immediately engaged with science. You're immediately engaged with other social, um, you know, with the hard sciences, with social sciences, with. Um, a wide range of communities that aren't like yours. Um, so it's, it's that, that kind of hit struck me really um, deeply this last year. And another thing that is, that is kind of detached to my burning question right now is um, the idea that this conversation is this the idea of global or global constantly, <laughs> always. You, you, if you're making a story about um, an estuary in a certain, you know, corner of the Everglades in South Florida, that is always going to be related to a larger story about other estuaries or about the extraction <coughs> industries or about agrotoxics or, you know, whatever the case is. And that there's just that tension that's always around us, right? And so we want to be making narratives that are interesting and creating stories of we're, we're, we're artists, working artists probably. That's what we're doing. And so you're not going to make a story about the whole world, right? You're going to make a story about a space that people can identify with that has characters, or however you want to frame it. So it's, it's that it has to be local and has to be global. Um, so my big thing lately is, and how can I say this? 
And I and I just want to say that the the question about the climate change phrasing and the terminology is certain sort of spooking me out right now. And I don't know if any of you were at the People's Climate March in September. Oh, yeah. Yes. <coughs> and it's about systems change, right? right. And and, mm -hmm. and and the thing that you know the extraction industries. Um, are related to it's just you know the appropriation of and the use of land and, and, and resources. This is this is always going to be you know about economics and about politics. You can't get away from the politics, right? Um, and I don't know if you if you remember when Naomi Klein spoke or if you've been reading her book, but she said there are no non-radical options left. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So it speaks to this thing about urgency. And so my <coughs> thing is, how do I make the work that I want to make? And how do I mount a militia of people, of artists, that are going to be ready to go to Santa Clara Pueblo? And like on the day that you need us to be there, we're all going to be there. Even though I'm making a piece about, you know, mermaids and plastic garbage in the ocean, like that's my thing, right? But if you call on me one day and you're like, I need you to come up here to the mesa and like do this with me, I'm going to be ready to go and, and kind of um, and stand with you. So that's my thing is like, how do we be this militia? that can work together collectively mm. and urgently and and the and smartly like in the most intelligent way that artists know how to work and then still be doing our really specific local stories that need to be told that need to be articulated because those local um those local efforts are the ones that are going to really grow roots create communities change local government and really be on the front lines of mm. of staving off some of this industry um, encroachment, which is inevitable because the way that our, our planetary systems are built around consumption are so embedded, it's not like them against us, it's like we're all part of it, right? So um, anyways, it's this, it's this kind of, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh man, you know, it's that tension between the local and the global that is, is really burning for me and trying to be in all, trying to be with my brethren globally and then also trying to be making my story about it. Uh, my name is Chantal Bilodeau and I'm a playwright and translator and I'm uh, involved in two um, big projects that have to do with climate change. The first one is a cycle of plays called The Arctic Cycle, which is a series of eight plays, um, one for each of the country, uh, each, each country in the Arctic, so there's eight of them, eight plays. and. Um, the goal, um, I have a few goals with these plays, of course it's to raise awareness about um, <coughs> climate change and the Arctic is such an um, icon right now that it's easily recognizable and what happens there, it's, it's happening faster, um, earlier, and so what we can observe there is of course going to um, be uh, played out in the rest of the world too. and. Um, I, it, and also I wanted, I, I started with one play and then I, I decided that I couldn't say everything I wanted to say in just one play, that's why I expanded. And also I was interested in seeing the differences between the different, the differences and the similarities between the different countries. Also the way um, I'm working on these plays, I, um, I set two challenges for myself for each of the plays. One is that I'm trying, uh, I'm including uh, artists from a different discipline with each play. So, and f actually from a, di from a different discipline and also from the country of origin where the play is set. So the first play was set in Canada and I used um, poems from a, an Inuit spoken word poet that were um, included, in, in, included in the play. I got her permission to use some of her poetry. The second play is set in Norway and I'm going to be working with a musician, a composer, um, who does uh, soundscapes and who lives in Norway. Um, I'm going there next week to do a workshop with a theater who's partnering with us. Uh, and the other goal is I, I'm very much trying to have, to put, to have the plays uh, presented here in the U.S. since this is where I live and in the country where it's set. And the, the, re the reason for these two things is I think in the process of making these plays, I can also model um, a type of collaboration that is uh, on a relatively small scale and that uh, would be certainly welcome on a much bigger scale. Like if, we, if, if the artist can um, do something you know, with very few resources and um, 
where we have to invent the process as we go, I can't imagine that businesses and governments couldn't do the same thing who have a lot more resources and um, people to draw on. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say about this, and I forgot. The second thing I'm doing, and I actually had it pulled up on the computer here. <coughs> I created this blog called Artists and Climate Change. And I, we have, we've compiled a list of resources, so we're going to pass that out to you, actually. Yeah. Um, Artists and Climate Change is a blog. There are two of us who write for it right now very infrequently, just because we have no funding and no time. <laughs> but uh, I would like to have it be much more active, where we just um, look for artists who, whose work address climate change and try to um, feature them on the website. So on the left, you can see um, the blog roll is a list of links to organizations who support um, artists doing this kind of work, or artists who have long-term projects, like, for example, um, James Balog, Extre uh, Extreme Ice Survey is in there, um, lower down. <coughs> and then on the, on the right, um, you have it, the articles are classified by categories according to the discipline, and then underneath later you have an archive um, by month. In addition to the blog, I created um, a Facebook group called Artists and Climate Change, which you can find. Um, we're up to uh, almost 400 members now. And um, this number went up very quickly. I think I created it three months ago. And we have people from all over the world. And I'm hoping to keep gathering people. And now that it seems like a significant amount of number, one of my burning questions is, what do we do? <laughs> you know, we have a group of people now. And I invite you all to join. You can, um, the link is on the page. And you can, you can just uh, request to join the group. And I will um, let you in. There's also there's a, p a Facebook page by the same name, which is um, the group is more for people to talk to each other, and the page is where I post all the work that I find by artists who um, uh, address climate change issues, and we also have a Twitter account. Um, yeah, so my I guess I have two burning questions. One is what do we do once we have a, a significant group of, of artists who are all working on the same thing? How can we um, harness this this resource and sort of take the next step as a group instead of just individually? And and my question as an artist is um, how do we inspire hope? Mm -hmm. I I do believe that um, part of the reason why people don't want to hear anything about climate change anymore. They're, they're just sick of the, the apocalyptic scenarios. Mm -hmm. And then if we can sort of shift that thinking, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying we should um, sugarcoat everything, but, but how, how do we look at, at what's happening and focus on, the, on help people grieve, for one thing, for the things that we know we're going to lose, and then take the next, the mm -hmm. next step, like transform that into a way to take action. I, I actually, I think I'm the only one who didn't actually talk about what I'm doing because oh. I thought we weren't supposed to, but I would love to just give a little oh, fun yeah, sketch. Yeah. So the group that I work with is called Musicians United to Protect Bristol Bay, and it started, Bristol Bay is one of the last pristine estuaries left in the world, and it's home to 46% of the world's remaining sockeye salmon. It also sits on what's believed to be the largest gold and copper ore deposit in the world. So there's a group called the Pebble Partnership that's trying to build the world's largest open pit mine at the headwaters of the two most abundant rivers mm. in the world. Um, so I was approached by Sai Kong, who's a blues and uh, bluegrass folk, um, pretty famous in that arena, um, to, to sort of translate his community organizing skills into an online campaign. So what we've done in two years, we've built uh, a website and we go to music conferences and, and have concerts and then through his 5,000 fans on Facebook, we sort of built out a mailing list and brought a couple of other people in. Um, so on the website, there's a toolkit for musicians. The idea when they sign up is that they're going to use their access to the media and use their networks of fans to help get the story out, um, to create original music about the beauty of life on the bay, but also the struggle to stop the mine. 
Um, and so on the website, there's a page of original music and music videos, and they're all allowed to use each other's stuff anytime. And we're actually about to create a, a video production scholarship that's um, where people who submit songs that don't have the money to make videos will be able to help them do that. Um, but the other thing that we do is we have an action alert. So when the EPA comment period opened up, uh, we send it out to the musicians and they send it out to their fans. So theoretically, there's a network of like 600,000 people getting what we send out, even though our mailing list is only 4,000 people. Um, so in terms of deployment strategies that are sort of low tech, and also in terms of getting people to, like music is such a good way of opening people's emotional space up to receive information that they might otherwise resist. Um, so I kind of wanted to just circle back around a little bit to the conversation of cultural mobility and this international idea. That's really the reason we're kind of all here in this building today. Um, one of the things that, that's come up in a lot of different conversations that I've had with people around um, kind of arts practice within the climate movement is that the international cultural exchange practices that a lot of us have in the cultural industries that we work in beyond kind of what our positioning and activity is inside the environmental movement usually contains or holds a lot of the values and operating principles of mutual respect and reciprocity that are so important for diplomacy, international cultural diplomacy in the case of international cultural exchange. And I, um, apart from my work as an artist you know, generating my own creative practice, I also work with the, with the National Performance Network in our international cultural exchange program with Latin America and the Caribbean and in in an over a decade old um, cultural exchange where we send groups back and forth every year. And it seems easy, but it's not, right? Um, it's, there's language barriers, there's logistics, there's lots of legal kind of visa stuff that we deal with. And it's so interesting that those practices and those networks that we've developed are actually some of the ideal channels to do the same, some work internationally, because you know, if we fix all of our climate issues in the United States, it doesn't matter. Because unless we're working on it globally, tactically, as a, you know, as, a, as a planetary society, we'll never achieve anything. And so we've already kind of forged these, these alliances internationally through a lot of the, go the global cultural work that we're doing. And it just seems really important for us, to me at least, to acknowledge that those alliances exist for us. And so, so I just, it just feels like the, those channels are already open. And, and if you know an artist in um, Syria, you know a climate activist in Syria. You know what I'm saying? It's, all, it's, it's you know, you, or if you, you are just one person removed from that artist, you know, bet your money on it. So it just seems like this network is already there. It's just kind of like floating almost. And, then, and if, um, I just wanted to, um, underscore the fact that we already have this network in our hands, but with, with the cultural work, the international cultural work that we're already doing, or the, you know, the, the interstate cultural work that we're already doing. Um, I, I think you're right in terms of the alignment of the principles, especially in terms of diversity and access. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think, I mean, our problem, we've done all of our funding from individuals so far. We haven't gotten any foundation grants or anything. It's just not like, so do we go to climate change people who don't really consider us climate change? Do we go to arts? So we we just had a, and I think the UN Convention is a great sort of document for the kind of language that we need to pull to to frame ourselves in that space. Um, we had a, a I'm going to really get specific here, a really sort of existential crisis with the Rockefeller Foundation. I was pitching a, a group called uh, Urban Sunspots, which are solar-powered cell phone recharging stations made out of 1950s gas pumps. So much fun. The idea was that the public art would get people to engage with it, and then they could get the phone charged really fast. And there was a, a LED component for learning. Um, the, the pump, instead of gallons, would do amps. And then it also had LED lighting and emergency communication protocols for post-disaster. So it could be a community beacon after a disaster. We had transportation, parks, and OEM in New York City and, mm. and the Brooklyn Tech Triangle as partners all lined up. Mm. And we've been talking to them for 14 months. We've moved it from one cycle to the next at their request so that they, because they had run out of money and time in that cycle. And 14 months into it, I got a call saying, uh, we need you to talk to Sam from the resiliency department. 
And I had, I was really worried because I've been to the Rockefeller Pop Tech Resiliency Summit at um, BAM and had spent a whole day there and walked out furious that they had never mentioned renewable energy. And I just couldn't understand how that could be. So uh, they, Sam said, please resubmit your proposal in the language of our resiliency website. So I did some research. I, I found a New York Times article that actually uh, listed the main investments of the Rockefeller family members that were on the board. And then I went to their resiliency website and I wrote to the team and I said, please be careful. Realize on the resiliency website, the only time they mention renewables is in India and Africa, not once in the United States as part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. So I thought we did a great job of like focusing on community workshops and making workshops with certified emergency response teams and those names. The idea was we were gonna bring one to New York for six months and put it in three different locations for two months each with workshops and publicity events and teaching people about it. So we submitted it and I got a letter back 16 months in saying, really sorry, this is not the answer you wanna hear. I'm sorry it's taken so long. The resiliency department liked a lot of, of your proposal, particularly the workshops and the post-disaster, but the renewable energy part to them is mitigation and our strategy is adaptation. And mitigation isn't mm -hmm. bad, but it's not adaptation. So if you want to resubmit it mm -hmm. as an adaptation proposal, basically take out the renewables, we're willing to socialize it into the next cycle. And I was like, yeah, no. But the problem is that Judith Roden is the head of every blue ribbon panel on resiliency that any politician in New York City pulls together. They have the 100 Resilient Cities project and they are actively keeping renewables out of the conversation and that's what we're up against. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have compiled this list that went around the room. We have about 35, 40 minutes left and I want to, I mean we can decide collectively how we want to use our time. Um, we can go through this list but I'd also like to, to invite everybody to contribute because we put this together with kind of stuff that we had, you know, like on, the, mm -hmm. on our desk. Thank and you. What we, know, what we know works, but there's probably other funding sources. There's probably state-based stuff that's really specific to, you know, local. And um, while going around and talking about each of those things might not be, the, be as efficient, uh, we're going to pass around our business cards and you can write us with all that. And we're going to compile a much larger amended list with your recommendations and then redistribute it. And we'll be diligent about, about doing that. Um, just, I just wanted to, that's kind of how this is going to work. I'm sorry, the recommendations are for? It's for anything that falls into <coughs> any of these categories or a category that you would like to add. Um, okay. And we have, um, so on this list you'll see that we have a section that talks about different kinds of networks of people that are you know doing uh, whether those are online communities um, you know, however whatever form it takes mostly virtual um, and there may be some meetings that are hosted by these networks um, and then there's funding which is you know foundations or other kind of you know, government that are really specific to artists mm -hmm. doing our environmental work um, there's residencies um, and then other resources um, and then there's conferences, meetings, meeting platforms. Um, what, something that came up earlier today in, in like the general session that I think is really important is how, how important face-to-face -face meetings are. Um, and I'm a true believer in face-to-face -face convenings. Um, whether or not that's a sustainable proposition um, is like a completely different part of that conversation. I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that it's nice to get together. I think that's where artistic collaborations are born. I think that's where you find the money. I think that's, um, you know, just there's a lot. And that's where you learn new language about what we're doing. And we're inventing this language as we go, so that's kind of cool. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to, you know, point that out. What, what do you, do you guys want to um, pick one of the burning questions that we talked about and dig deeper into that as a conversation? Do we want to look, go one by one through this list? Um. Well, uh, I, I just had, uh, as we were going around, I was mm -hmm. thinking about <clears throat> what, what can any of us contribute to the burning questions mm -hmm. uh, uh, as, as possible answers uh, uh, for, and you take what you want out of, uh, you know, what anybody has to say. Already, people have already suggested several things, but, but uh, one thing that came to to my mind is, uh, uh, which was which you brought up about how do you reach out beyond your normal audience, or uh, how do we? Uh, and, and it's actually uh, uh, several people have sort of mentioned it in different ways. But uh, how do you how do we 
uh, uh, make the the issue compelling enough to make people uh, really listen. So, uh, to what we're trying to say, uh, uh, I have two suggestions. Uh, one of which we've experimented with for several years now, and have found uh, to be more and more successful. Uh, because every time we do a play, it's about a different issue. And so we have to reach a different audience. And uh, that's actually a wonderful kind of challenge to uh, <laughs> get you off your ass and also to reach a new community. So uh, what we have done uh, is we combine every single performance with an expert on the issue from a different aspect of that issue. And uh, uh, of course, uh, th th this, this last play, because it was about the environmental issue, uh, has produced the most incredible range of people. And um, it, it is wonderful a way to do it because the audience, when you open them up, okay, with whether it's music, visual, language, uh, a great story, by the way, is important. Uh, one of the ways that you can get people engaged is to give them a good, satisfying story. Uh, and usually, if you can base it on real events, real events that uh, come out of their community or some community that they know, uh, uh, and then add whatever you want to add, but um, uh, you know, keep it in that realm. And we also we we took a. The, the story of this, uh, the uh, climate change scientist, the very famous one, James Hansen, who quit, the, and who quit NASA to become a full-time uh, climate change activist. And, he, and he, he was the first guy to get in front of Congress in 88 and tell them, you know, hey, there's climate change, and they all went to sleep. And ever since then, he's been fighting to get the message out, and he, they keep censoring him, and. Uh, you know, taking him off the list and so on and so on. So, uh, and then we combine that with a family struggle over the land use uh, of a piece of land that they had, uh, which was totally fictitious, but it allowed us to bring in fracking and uh, renewable and uh, the carbon tax and all these things. And the audience loved it. Uh, because it was a struggle uh, within a family. Uh, but what they really loved also was the very satisfying thing of getting to hear what the experts have to say about it. So they got the, uh, a double whammy. And then the experts brought their own audiences because they're all f well known people in their field there. Uh, and uh, so we had really the best kind of. Uh, uh, we, the last few weeks were sold out, and you know it, it, it made a huge difference. So I throw that out. Just a couple of things I I picked up from what everybody's saying. I love. I mean, the, the sense of urgency is something that 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 it just it, it. We've been talking and talking about this in Britain for as long as I can remember, and every year that goes by, it's getting closer and it's scary. And I loved your idea of the militia or actually pulling pulling us all together and actually getting the blogs and getting, so there's lots of information I could supply from people in Britain who are doing this sort of mm. stuff. I think the, the, the hope and the, and the despair argument is really interesting. I don't know if you've heard of a, a scientist called Stephen Emmett who's written a book called Ten Billion and he staged this on the stage of the Royal Court Theatre in London a couple of years ago and it was the most depressing picture I've ever, he wanted to come out and put the gun straight into your temple when you'd seen it. it was, it was really strong but terrifying. And on the other hand, another scientist who called called um, no, completely um, completely gone blank now. Um, but he he was saying how he feels the arts can totally, from the scientific point of view, should and can inspire people to make change. And he was working at the British Antarctic Survey, and he they they drilled down into into the ice for thousands upon thousands of years. And he just said showing people this ice that was 125,000 years old or something was actually, in a way for him, that was almost a, a, an art thing in itself and making people totally inspired by how old the world is mm -hmm. and how this ice has been impacted and what we're doing to it. And I, th I think... So these two opposite scientist views, Chris Rapley, his name was, I remember. The other thing I'm really aware of, a few of you have said, and coming from an English perspective, 
we're, we still, thank heavens, have some state funding. And actually, the idea that you might have people on your board who are sitting, coming from one of the fossil fuel industries, is, to me, is so terrifying. Mm -hmm. And we, it makes me go home and think, my God, we need to hang on to this state funding. Because actually, I think, you know, I've always thought it, there must be a way that people self-censor in, in, in the simplest of ways, the work they're, they're, they're we, we producing. Were, we were told but, but by But even a, more so sorry, than that, yes. We no, were absolutely. told by a theatre you best take your play to England because our board members are all f invested in fossil fuels. Mm. And see, but sort of then coming back to Naomi Klein, as she says, it, it, on its own, it's, it's nothing. We have to relate it to everything else that's going on, and that's why right. all of this is such a bigger issue than climate change, because it's on its own, it doesn't work. I mean, sorry, these are just a jumble thing, but there's mm -hmm. everything of a piece. Because if your grandchild will not be able to live exactly. in the condo that you bought on the beach with the fracking money, which is literally <laughs> going to happen because the water is rising. It has The stories also have to make things real for people in a way that relates to them. And mm -hmm. the militia thing, I have to tell you, like that idea scares me because it's, I, while I'm fully in support of the ideas behind it, I think that by using radical language, it's another way of putting fear out there. And people are afraid, or, or it's too much for them. It's such a big issue. So for, even for myself as just a human being on the planet where this is something I think about all the time, I would love to talk about what, what can, like, how can we collaborate and in eco-friendly ways and, and sustainable ways. Because I work in mutual understanding as well, but to get on a plane to be here means I'm harming the environment. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And so there's a balance there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's also a conversation I would really like to have because I'm using paper, I'm using electricity, these are things I have to use to do my job. And so the idea that the mutual understanding for me is about the multiple, the multiple roles that we all are, because all artists are members of society in some way, but it affects everyone. And I'm always conscious of the fact that while I may have a more risk-taking activist personality in my family, I'm the only one. <laughs> but they're all really opinionated and they all really, you know, want to want to fight and, and, and be passionate. And so I think there, there have to be ways for us to also have I was just assuming you were using that word militia as a sort yeah. of not I knew I thought no, you were using it as a sort of galvanizing it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean yeah. I think there's I think there's, you know, this that we could, you know, kind of nitpick the semantics of it. But I do mean it in a in a way that is not um, you know, traditionally militaristic. But um, <laughs> I do uh, in a sense of um, in a sense of coming togetherness and and of um, and mm -hmm. of um, being willing to take a risk of making some people uncomfortable. I think that there is this tension around, okay, like how do we all go to, you know, New Mexico? I'm sorry, I'm totally looking at you because my mom is, lives in yeah. Bahama, Suevo, okay. right next to Bahama, okay. so I know this area. But, Get your um, manager good. Then. And I have a lot of love for that. <laughs> I have a lot of love for it. But, um, so, so what, has anybody ever heard of that book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor by Rob Nixon? He articulates beautifully the idea, and this speaks to a little bit about dramaturgy, and um, how do we create effective narratives about things that have no heroes, that have no, um, that, that aren't starring anyone, that are about this time scope of, you know, three generations of people that are slowly being poisoned, and to the point where it's like by the time the, the grandchild is born with some unidentifiable, can unidentifiable cancer, no one even remembers the, the company that was, you know, had the power, whatever plant was making whatever toxic. I mean, it's, it's this really difficult thing to work with dramaturgically as an artist. So this is something that I think is important for us to, I don't know how we're going to fix it or work with it, but we need to be aware of that's why it's hard to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. And and if, you, if anybody is interested, I'll share that that on our mm -hmm. list. But um, my clients with musicians are always censoring out my militaristic <laughs> <laughs> references. I, I agree. I, I think there's a place for it. No, I, I understand. I understand where it. you're coming from, but I understand the yeah. impulse to use it as well. Um, I really think that part of what we need to do is, I think there is anger worldwide about social injustice and the oligarchy. And I think we need to tap into that somewhat because anger is a better emotion than despair at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it is all social justice. I mean, mineral rights are about 
a company being able to take your land away from you because mm -hmm. there's minerals underneath the surface of the dirt. Um, and I mean, it's all about the, the benefit of a very few who don't seem to understand that they have grandchildren. Um, so I, I feel like part of our job is to, without losing focus, constantly broaden how people view us so that they don't go, oh no, the environmentalists are going, um, and I think that there's room for that because it is a social justice issue. I wonder if people in this room are familiar at all with the Dark Mountain Project. Mm -hmm. Do you guys know about it? Um, I just pulled them up on the website because I didn't want to misquote them. Um, but the Dark Mountain Project is, a, I'm just going to read from the website, is a network of writers, artists, and thinkers who have stopped believing uh, the stories our civilization, civilization tells itself. We see that the world is entering an age of ecological collapse, material contraction, and social and political unraveling, and we want our cultural responses to reflect this reality rather than denying it. Okay. Uh, I'm going I'm to pull a quote out of, and I, please forgive me for the, I'm about to mispronounce Upanishads, the in East Indian books, and it's often a quote often attributed to Gandhi, which is that the thought is to the word, the word is to the deed, the deed is to the action, mm -hmm. and the action is your life. Mm -hmm. As you think and as you visualize, whether it's militaristically or darkly, mm -hmm. that's what you create. Mm -hmm. And that's what we create if we go that route of mm -hmm. addressing it in those kinds of terms. So that's my contribution as the muggle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. I wonder, um, with all the questions that we brought up, if there are, if maybe we can think about um, possible solutions. Like, if, is there are there any ways we can help each other? Are there any other resources we could tap into? Do we need to um, educate funders? Um, sort of uh, something a little bit more action oriented that we might be able to. I do think funder education could actually be a useful mm -hmm. effort. Uh -huh. um, I certainly have found in our efforts to fundraise around this cause, you know, I, mean, I looked at your list and, you know, there, the, the number of funders who understand the role artists play not necessarily as disseminators. I mean, so many people want artists to basically be their, the, the puppet for mm -hmm. disseminating facts and information about, mm -hmm. you know, which are all well and fine, but as we've discussed, are not necessarily actually what moves people to reevaluate their own behaviors and actions. And getting funders to understand the unique role, supporting artists who are actually making art that opens up that space for resonance to be found as opposed to a more dogmatic approach. Mm -hmm. You know, I look, I, I don't know all of these funders, but the Rauschenberg Foundation is like one of the few incredibly enlightened, mm -hmm. you know, because it's founded by an artist who did this work. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I wonder how many other people would be open to that kind of a conversation. Mm -hmm. Very little hope for the funders. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they are the, they've always been the sentinels of the uh, rich and the status quo, and now the rich and status quo is a full-on oligarchy. So it's no wonder that almost all the New York philanthropies have pulled out of arts funding. It makes perfect sense. There's only like two, three standing left. One of the things I thought was really interesting um, because I think also, um, to paraphrase, I think you, you, you try to see what you can affect, right? And um, so I thought what was really interesting is this little woman that left. She was talking about bringing artists to different, I think she was talking about scientific conferences, mm -hmm. and letting them, showing people how artists can be a part of the conversation. Um, and I, I think that that's very useful when you're doing interdisciplinary work. And I think there's also maybe something reciprocal there, where bring scientists in, not only to c consult on the topic and the content, but scientists and artists follow very similar processes. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that in general that we put our heads together around the processes. And I think there's a lot of, of strengthening that we could do for each other there. Because sometimes scientists don't express things very well. And sometimes artists don't necessarily capture their process the same way. So I think there's some, something there. And also, I noticed on this list that um, uh, the, this is, I think this is a really great list. Thank you so much for starting it. Um, but also, for people who really are inclined to do advocacy work, I think there's really a place to talk to environmental organizations about 
we have artist activists on this issue. What can we do with you? Can we come to your advocacy events? And what can we offer you? But also, what can we learn from you? And, and work with them directly. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody wants to do that. But for those that do. And I just kind of want to just follow up because I don't want to totally give up on the funders. Yeah. Um, even though I totally understand your, your frustration. <laughs> but exactly actually, it, it may be that we're, approach we're approaching from an arse lens, and could we make a case to people who are already on the environmental bandwagon, <clears throat> but not necessarily in the arts, mm -hmm. about yeah, the role that artists play in furthering the conversation and the cause. Um, and I also wonder, you just said something that triggered something in me, that like, could we get in a sort of small, actionable thing, like a group of people together and, and put together a panel discussion at the grant makers in the arts conference? Uh, that where the audience is funded yes. yeah, that to actually have mm -hmm. a conversation about what do artists it. need to do this work. There are oh, oh, and, and not just what artists do. Yeah. Why funders actually have to take the way the Rauschenberg, like I would call the head of the Rauschenberg Foundation oh. and say, can you organize a panel about how we get other funders? You're a leader here. Get other funders to follow your lead about why it's important to be supporting this through the arts. And there are two, there are already two um, funder organizations that do social change work. So mm -hmm. there are social change funding co like collaborations. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, all the council on foundations, they have annual conferences every year. Mm -hmm. Their members are, or, their, are foundations. Mm -hmm. They've looked at environmental issues before, but they oh, haven't yeah. looked together and thought. Yeah, there's, and so now I just think there's a new, it's, it's just starting to kind of bubble up, I think, this, mm -hmm. this um, marriage between their, you know, what they're now calling kind of climate activism and, and culture. Yeah. So it's going to be like the Rauschenberg, with, and then here the Serdna Foundation right. has done some initiatives, and also the Nathan Cummings is, um, has announced that they will be kind of unveiling their programs for next year. Right. I was just going to say, there is a, did you know, it's on this list, Tipping Point in the UK, mm -hmm. have done a lot of work yeah. with, with, I mean, with a lot of conferences, I've been to lots of them with arts and scientists together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those debates are really interesting. It's really interesting mm -hmm. getting the two talking to each other. And, and But we went to see our Arts Council, and I know this is state funding again, but the gang of, of maybe 15 organisations went to see our Arts Council and said, would you please put it into our funding agreements that if you give us funding, we need to write a green, uh, you know, a green mm -hmm. document like we have to do for diversity mm -hmm. and disability yeah. and things. And their first reaction was, oh God, if we give you any more bureaucracy, you're all going to be shouting us, Look, don't, we don't really want to do it. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, please, will you do it? We're asking you to do it. And they did. And actually, mm -hmm. now they're quite proud of themselves, I think. They, they, <laughs> they, went, to, they, went, to, they went to the Australian Arts Council were saying, my goodness me, yeah, that's the... So actually, it does what I absolutely agree. I think you should, it's, yeah. it's really worth talking to the funders because it's just edu educating them. You'll end up on a panel that you just wrote in. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she'll get yeah. shamed. You know, yeah. 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 Or, or forget it. Like, there's some people, fine, that's not what they're going to do. Yeah. But there are other people who, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I wouldn't or, give up know, on the entire sector. And there are other people who wait 10 years because they would love to do that, but for whatever reason, the climate mm -hmm. that they're in won't let them, and they wait, and then suddenly they're in limit. And, you know, and we know that foundation funding and government funding, to a large extent, moves in cycles. Yeah. They, you know, like this whole creative placemaking, mm. um, you know, mm -hmm. thing, this wave that came over the United States about how to, you know, do that. And I don't know if you're familiar with that particularly. Those, so it's like, you know, how do we build these communities that are all about the creative industries? And then, it, but there was all these embedded kind of, um, you know, consequences of gentrification in these areas that were being <coughs> renovated through culture and that the arts. they refused to discuss during the process. Right, and so, and, but all this money, all of our culture money from the United States went into those initiatives, and I think, like, conceptually they were really great, but it was like, wait a minute, who drove that, and how did that happen? And so, this happens in funding, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, we can try and be vigilant, try and be participative in that process. We kind of got to ride those waves. One of the things that, that I'm doing in Miami is, is developing an initiative to create kind of a conversation platform, a little performance um, embedded into it. Um, and we're inviting people from other sectors to meet with artists to have a dialogue about, you know, what is a, what is an arts field that's capable of paradigm shift look like in our region? Mm -hmm. What is that, what do we do as artists to contribute? And one of the questions we're asking to the Office of Sustainability for Miami-Dade County is, what do you need from us? Yeah. What do you need from artists mm -hmm. to help us create this, this, this community that we all want to be able to live in? And because I think artists, um, many times, you know, we have a really clear idea of what we want to make, mm -hmm. and we, we bring our art as our offering. And 
but I think there's other ways that we can participate. You know, we maybe we can sit at policy tables and, and put our creative thinking and you know next right sit down next to a scientist like you're saying. You know, and the, where, where the thinking processes are so similar, right? The creative processes are so similar, and so I'm really in favor of that. And uh, so I don't know, um, and that's obviously you know very particular to where you live, but I think those yeah. those are ways that artists yeah. can really participate in, in civic engagement. Yeah. beside the work that they're making, the artwork they're making. Well, it, it's so important that, I mean, everybody around this table is, is, is making or trying to make uh, uh, eco art, and it's so important. Uh, one of our, uh, the people who spoke after one of the shows who has uh, uh, written several books on this, uh, uh, just on the whole eco issue, he just said, it's so important that uh, the ecology appear in the culture, mm -hmm. in the art that people make, because the, the, the voice has to come from uh, other, you know, it has to come from artists as much as it has to come from experts. I mean, the, the art has to start speaking mm -hmm. uh, these things, these truths. And uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to some wonderful uh, projects because uh, that there's where uh, ordinary people who are like uh, either afraid uh, about the issue or overwhelmed by it they need to be moved by art and uh, because art is the one thing that opens you up uh, you know once you're open you know people start being able to listen you know. but if they're just closed in with fear uh, you know we won't get anywhere. We'll just be yelling at each other, like you said. So, uh, yeah. But but let's just you know. Well, I think we're also um, in in the most difficult part of the journey in the sense that you know we're still very marginalized and it's we're still very much talking about an issue, right? People are doing eco theater or they're doing eco art or climate change art, just like you know there was all this advocacy for women's stuff and yeah. like we have to get over the hump where we don't have to, to, to it doesn't have to be its own niche that people are just used to experiencing that because that's just part of how we live and that's just part of our world and it's reflected in, in the art that we make. Um, I, in my experience also um, doing my own work, I've had a lot of success um, with universities. I think that's a, that's a really big untapped resource right now because, because there are the people who are open to thinking about this stuff. They're open to thinking about it um, in an in, in, in interdisciplinary way. And I think they're hungry. I think we're both hungry for each other, but we don't know how to find each other. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I'd like to speak to that um, and touch upon something that Amy um, first mentioned about the process. You mm -hmm. asked a question about, you know, we, we need to be focusing more on this process. And, uh, and you're so new to Superhero Clubhouse, but for the past, I think, four years, we've been working with, with Jeremy and Superhero Clubhouse, mm -hmm. and they are exemplary in their process mm -hmm. of engaging the scientists and the institutions surrounding the scientists in a very collaborative um, art making process. Mm -hmm. So they don't just come to the scientists afterwards. And I would imagine um, Mara with um, with Phantom Limb, uh, Jessica, right? Mm -hmm. That she's because she was. Um, we invited Jessica to the first Tipping Point conference in North America, which we hosted at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. And so, and Jeremy from Superhero Clubhouse was there too, and we really talked a lot about process and. A positive feedback kind of formed in response to Tipping Point pr preceded us as an event that took place and then there were a few of us around the table that were like the Tipping Point was designed to be a catalyst for something else to happen and we were the something else that happened at Columbia mm. um, with also um, NYU and um, CUNY and um, and in terms of resource opportunity, there's a lot of government funding that does go into the sciences at universities that in a way that those university researchers and their departments and their centers can be conduits for that government funding to go into the hands of artists. And Marta Kern, who just left the room a little while ago, would definitely speak to that. She's seen a lot of success with very, very large-scale large, large scale funding from NSF and NASA um, come through the scientists. and 
the scientists might think they have a small grant for $250,000 to do a tiny little project of what they're working on, because really they have maybe like five or six of those small $250,000 grants. And then there's a tiny itsy bitsy little component of that small grant that goes to public outreach, maybe like ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year or something. Now, to this scientist in a large institutional organization whose salary, you know, if their faculty is already paid for by hard funding from the university, they're not even raising their own salary, um, they're eager to find artists and artist organizations with whom to collaborate to basically further their reach because they're really focused on their research project. But, you know, even a small portion of that teeny weeny little bit of ten thousand dollars which i'm being facetious here because that can go a long way for an individual artist and an art centered organization and so it's that is one of the avenues of untapped potential and then the other avenue i think is within um, pretty much each university there is someone or some group that is a part of um, like an office of government and community engagement that is the conduit for both the sort of political um, outreach that the university has to their local political leaders and then also to their local on the ground community activists. And they play sort of, um, you know, a middleman ground. And I think that there's a big opportunity for the arts to come into that realm. And at, I can speak at Columbia. Um, the person who heads that office at Columbia, Marcia Sells, comes from an arts background herself. She has a dual appointment in the um, School of the Arts and in the President's Office at this um, um, Government Community Affairs, and she's just started a, a university seminar series on arts and science collaborations mm -hmm. and how artists and scientists work together. And um, here in New York City, the newly appointed head of sustainability initiatives for the mayor's office, Nilda Mesa, was a participant in the first Tipping Point conference that we held here in New York. She is an artist herself. She used to run an artist residency retreat in France. And she happens to be working in environmental sustainability in New York right now. And I know for a fact that she's very receptive to the, um, the power, uh, the collective power of the arts um, in sort of, um, you know, combining with environmental sustainability. I don't quite yet know how. I don't know quite yet what the right angle is. But the, this is real, tangible offices and people and institutions. And I'm only speaking about Columbia because I'm there right now. I, I know that our, our institutional partners, NYU and CUNY, also have these pretty much every university, both in the United States and abroad, is going to have similar areas and offices and, and to tie this into the, to the theme of today's um, symposium of cultural mobility, there's a lot of cultural mobility in the sciences already mm -hmm. that's very, very heavily funded by the respective governments of those institutions and by a lot of other uh, you know, private foundations. And so again, kind of connecting and, and collaborating and developing partnerships with the universities and the academic institutions in those countries and in this room we're talking about environmental sustainability and climate change to tap into those leaders within the universities um, is I think just a great idea mm -hmm. so I think we should mm -hmm. we should do more of that um, and we're we're trying positive feedback what we're looking to do in the upcoming year year and a half ahead is to organize our own um, symposium on the role of universities um, in this exact field, what we can do, how we can lend um, our resources to both the artist organizations, the activist organizations, um, connecting through um, the the sciences. So I'll uh, no, that's, that's take the court anymore. Mm. But but we're 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 in that realm. We want to be there, and uh, and this is great mm -hmm. to hear. Like there's a need for it. Well, another thing too that I was thinking about, and we had, we spoke about is in my research is that. I can't find any texts out there about this work. They're mm -hmm. they're You're not right. there yes. yet. Like they don't yes. exist yet because yes. we're just we're making that work and we have enough an, an, enough years to kind of reflect on it in an academic setting to make those texts surface in academia and elsewhere. So I just think that universities can be a great portal for those that writing and that research. And I would hope that right. they could house some of that somehow. If I could just take you off on a tangent before we all disperse. 
Um, we've talked a lot about about the funding that goes into, you know, what we're what we're trying to put into effect here. But there's also, um, I guess, from from my perspective, a way of telling these stories. Um, that you mentioned mm -hmm. that you know you have to have a good story, mm -hmm. and and I would encourage all of you to um, tap into the. Uh, seemingly underutilized resource that is Native America mm -hmm. and the 36 mm -hmm. tribal colleges and universities in this country from west coast to east coast um, there's your militia right there there's mm -hmm. your there's your group of people who have um, these uh, I guess primordial original instructions yep. is what we like to refer to it as mm -hmm. um, and there's a great book out there called original instructions and in it, it'll um, tell you about how there's already this, this dialogue. Um, it's, a, it's an ancient and sacred and beautiful dialogue of our traditional ecological knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful way to tell these stories, to get that information out there. And it's been around for, you know, so, <laughs> so many years, so many years. Um, I'd also like to, to add to the networks on your sheet. Um, it's called the Indigenous Environmental Network. So there is already a, a group out there that is um, that works with a lot of indigenous groups and tribes, um, specifically, you know, for fracking and for um, uh, tar just sands. tar sands. I mean, um, I so many of my friends just went to uh, I, I think it was North Dakota or one of the Dakotas to talk recently about the Keystone XL. I mean, that, and they just went on their own, just got a bunch of caravans going, and, and so there's students and young activists and young leaders out there, um, I'll include myself in that group, who, who are willing to get into this, and so please don't overlook us and, and um, call on us. Hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're almost done. So I say that, I mean, some, some, so the three takeaways that I'm identifying from our time is the first thing is this list, besides everybody's contributions at the table. This list, um, we have your contacts. And what I think the, maybe the good system would be, I'm gonna go ahead and pass out my card, so if anybody just wants to be a direct connection via email, that can happen, even Chantel's also. So please don't hesitate if you have anything to add to this list, we'll, we'll um, put it in and then we'll send the list again to everybody in a yeah. digital format. And maybe what I'll do is just send a group email out prompting you to do that as a reminder. Yeah. And, and you know, again, like anything, like any kind of, I think a bibliography is also really nice. So if there's mm. books that mm. you would like to recommend, this is all, I think it's really important to have oh, tons okay. yeah. of great writing. Uh, and, and can I ask, uh, <laughs> this John was kind enough to write the minutes, uh, mm. can we get a copy of yeah, I'll type. What you what oh, you wrote? Yeah. Thank you. Because uh, are you gonna are you gonna do